Warren Buffett's been doing a lot recently, but he has a little trick up his sleeve. He's got a little bit of a secret that he's not really telling everyone what's going on, but he's showing it through his actions. Now, we all know Warren Buffett sold a large share of Apple. Now, that hit big headlines. It moved Apple stock pretty much, but what he's not really talking about or no one's really talking about is him selling Bank of America. It kind of pops up in the news, dies down, pops up in the news. And I want to dissect a little bit why this is important, why this has huge ramifications for the stock market. And also remember, this is the guy that said there is another shoe to drop in the banking sector over a year ago when FRC did its whole collapsing thing and caused a lot of stress in the banking sector. Well, the main thing I want to talk about is this. So Warren Buffett's been selling Bank of America, and there's a key thing in this section right here. Berkshire Hathaway has slashed his stake from 1.03 billion shares to 794 million shares, still holding a large percentage of Bank of America stock, reducing its ownership from 13.2% to, here's the key, 10.2. Why is that number important? Well, simply put it, it's important because under 10%, he does not have to report it within two business days. So if you're a big tycoon like he is, and you want to get out of Bank of America, you can't just get out in one, two days. I would just destroy the entire stock. It would eliminate the entire buy side of the market for that particular stock. Remember, he has 10% of ownership of the total stock that exists in the world of Bank of America. That's huge. Really, you don't see many individuals with that percentages unless they're like the CEO, like Elon Musk with Tesla or something like that. So looking at this, this means that he's finally getting down to that 10% level. So in the next, let's say two weeks, he's going to get under that 10% threshold. When he does that, he's not under SEC regulations to report it within two business days and where he can go to a market maker and basically sell a large proportion of it, which is setting up to the next big leg to drop, which is him selling a huge proportion of Bank of America stock like he did Apple stock. And that means for the markets that they're basically looking at it being like, hey, everything's hunky-dory. We saw this with uh, various things like the yield curve actually starting to turn back up where I'm like, is this going to re-invert? That's another question of how it's going to affect markets. Markets, as we covered in the last two weekend deep dives, have been in a chop fest for quite some time. We did actually get a push out of the range, but we've been just chopping and chopping and chopping around. Now, we did actually have some uh, interesting movement this week where we had uh, several weekly breakdowns. The bears were not successful successful in pushing us downward, which sets us up for an interesting rally opportunity coming this week, especially with on deck is going to be the CPI report that is coming out on Thursday of this week, or sorry, on yes, on Thursday of this week with 2.3 expected versus 2.5 previously for the main headline number. Markets most likely are going to take this and rally with it. We also see it on the Qs and the S&P that we're setting up a very bullish opportunity for the markets. We're basically setting up, starting to get that rotation. Trend's still bullish. It's still weak though, right? So we, we got to pay attention to, we have to keep in the back of our minds that potential to sell off. And What's going to be the main catalyst for this week, in my opinion, is going to be CPI. There's nothing really much. We have FOMC minutes, but again, the Fed has done an excellent job of projecting what they're going to be telling you and what's going to be coming out. So over the past subsequent, I would argue, three to four Fed meeting minutes, it really has been a nothing burger event. Whereas if you go back to early 2024, those were like catastrophic events where we basically were just looking at huge moves in the market. Now with the Fed kind of giving that message and kind of giving a very uh, hawk, uh, bullish tonation, right? That dovish tonation, we don't really see much coming from it, especially Tuesdays are not much. We got a couple of Fed members speaking at line of Fed GDP, but everything is gonna be calm and reserved for that Thursday event. That's going to be the big kahuna for this week. Also, markets, as I mentioned, are indicating that they could go to rally side. But what does that mean in the grand scheme of things? How do we know we're going to continue having that bullish upside, right? So we can simply clean up chart real quick here and show you guys the weekly levels that you have to pay attention to for the remainder of the week and basically know if you need a bullish side or bear side the market. So looking at S&P, it's a pretty simple split for us. 574.38, again, this number that just keeps holding around for all eternity. We also got 565.27, so larger range for the week, but we have some other indicators 
indicators that we can use to kind of discern which area we should be bullish or bearish. First of all, we get the nine day moving average, which we got plenty back above. We also have this level sitting around that 570 number, which indicates previous rotationary point that we chopped around. We had that as resistance, broke above it, came down below it on Friday, and then pushed back above it. So that's basically an area of support that we're gonna have for the week. Closing at 572.98 is going to lead us to further upside potential in the markets. Also, well, when we cover the NASDAQ in just a second, you'll see what that potential is. And with CPI on deck, it really is very easy to determine what that's going to be. And the NASDAQ is going to be the main indicator that we're going to go to simply because the NASDAQ is the one that has more structure in it. We did close right at our rotationary level, which is 487.32. We closed just a smidge, actually directly on it. So the NASDAQ, basically, you can look, if it's green, it's bullish, if it's red, is bearish. It's very, very simple for the weekly candle. And we have a lot of potential to the upside. You have a lot of price structure, which is covered in this area right here, that we can see that bullish rotation occurring because that's gonna be a floor for the NASDAQ. Now, if we break the nine day moving average, we break around 485, 484, and then we start tackling 477, uh, 40, that's gonna be our bearish tonation in the market, right? If we go to this price action over here, we can clearly see that we're gonna get more and more bearish as we head towards that because you're breaking a lot of that pre-established price structure. There's a lot of volume that was transacted at these levels and volume has essentially calmed down. So we're contracting in volume, contracting in price. So we're setting up a massive move. Again, with the CPI on deck, it's gonna be very, very easy to have that catalytic style move. So really 47.32 is gonna be the rotationary point. If we're rotating above it, that's new uneventful price action, right? What I mean by that, we only have two or three recent candles in that price action. We've previously had the all time highs in that price action as well, but there's not a lot of volume that's transacted there. So there, meaning that you're gonna get very quick moves through it. It's basically a hot knife through butter moment. And that's why I'm leaning towards that bullishness. As we mentioned in the beginning of the video, that NASDAQ is setting up right over here for that bullish rotation to the upside. We're actually curling on the smart money flow. So this is gonna basically be a point that we have to keep on watching. RSI is ready to cross over right over here. And we can clearly see that the market is starting to rotate to that upper area. We wanna see that price action kind of get up into the 498s, which on the NASDAQ 498 would take us significantly above the weekly level. That would be putting us right at all time highs. And then we could be looking for a new break of all time highs as the market basically is not bothered by the point that Fed rate cuts are basically priced in right now at 25 basis points. They're saying, eh, 25 basis points, there's a couple of people in the crowd that are saying like, you're not gonna get this, two, you're not gonna get a cut. In my personal opinion, the Fed is not just gonna stop cutting, right? They're just pricing that in to say, hey, 100% is not necessarily what we wanna be. You got always people that are gonna be the contrarian of the group. However, again, with the CPI report expected to come in at a 2.3, that is extremely, extremely bullish because that means that we're on a path to 2% inflation, that 50 basis point cut may be reignited very, very, very easily. And we could see these odds flip drastically, especially if we get that data point on Thursday. And the markets could be setting up for something very interesting, right? Like, let's just theorize this out. Let's say we get some price action down here in the 484, 483, and then go subsequently going into Thursday, we're just rotating up to 493.70, and we just get a massive 1% gap, NASDAQ 2% day, S&P 1%, 1.5% day, right? Especially that bullish momentum, and you get that classical blow off top. Now, there's other underlying things that we have to talk about. We're gonna be looking at commodities, but I wanna do a general scoping of some of the more riskier assets, right? So Bitcoin first on deck. So you can always look to see which side you need to be bullish, which side you need to be bearish based on Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is just the totality of where people are thinking risk on, risk off, right? So if we look at Bitcoin and we actually extend this line here, again, we hit bop our head on this resistance and then we, we're just like, bank, and then we just come back down to the 50 day moving average. This has been Bitcoin's story for almost a very, very long while, right? One, two, three, four subsequent hits. That resistance point is gonna get weaker and weaker and weaker. But if you zoom out into the grand scheme of things, this just thing just looks like a gigantic flagpole right here. So Bitcoin is prime 
to break out, but if this pattern goes the other way, it is very, very bearish. The same thing that we have to keep an eye on, the VIX, right? The VIX has been a bullish bearish indicator recently that has been, been pretty reliable. We are elevated levels of the VIX. So this presents an interesting opportunity to basically sell options. You don't necessarily wanna be the buy side, because even though you're gonna get the delta move that you want, you're paying a premium, so you're not making as much profit. VIX has a higher probability right now to come back down to 15, especially with the setup of the markets. The markets are gonna be thinking calm, cool, and collective. They're not necessarily gonna be thinking that bad things are happening. We can say that the yield curve is basically ready to re-invert again and doing loop-de-loops on itself, which who thought of that one? But as you can see, VIX is not indicating further degradation in the markets. I personally think everyone that thinks long-term bullish right now is in the loony bin. However, am I going to fight that? No, my opinion is put off to the side, my money-making hat's put on, and then I look at the charts. So simply going back to this, VIX has a higher probability right now to lower down. As we see, we see some consolidation after a push, and we can push back down towards the lower side. So we got Bitcoin in an interesting position, finding around support. We got VIX in an open area. Let's take a look at some of the bigger cap stocks and also the Russell. The Russell has just been a chop fest that is very hard to discern because small caps are like bullish, bearish, bullish, bearish, bullish, bearish. They can't really discern and find clear given direction. Whereas the bigger cap stocks like Microsoft pulling back to that 200, holding a within a couple cents closing below. So it is showing some weakness, right, in those bigger cap stocks, but that could also be a rotationary factor. CPI could reinvigorate and set up them, or we're gonna see something breaking down. We'll keep you guys updated, so make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel and have bell notifications on so you know which way things are going and always stay up to date with us. Also, Apple the King, just been a chop fest, right? So I don't necessarily look at this as being a bad thing. Prices going sideways is basically consensus. Now the consensus can be broken one way or another, which sets up a massive catalyst event. We got a catalyst event on Thursday. So I'm looking, okay, market's really not selling off. Apple kind of in a chop fest, bigger cap stocks, not looking the hottest, but they're not looking terrible. So this could definitely lead to a blow off top scenario, and new all time highs. As we keep going down the list, Amazon, again, similar story, just chop fest, had a big push off the 200, broke above the 50, came back, almost tested it. I personally look at it like neutral. I don't look at this bearish or bullish. Netflix holding strong, keep pushing up, trying to get that th that thousand dollar mark, kind of pull in a video, do a 10 to one split probably. You got Tesla with Elon finally getting above that 200 again. Let's see if we can hold that. We got Nvidia the king, not looking bearish, not looking bullish, just kind of a chop fest, right? So everything's calm, cool, and collective in the markets. Similarly, how VIX, VIX is basically pricing in some volatility in there, but it's not pricing in catastrophic volatility, right? Google, after bouncing, basically pushing up higher to 168, we got AVGO massive bounce off the September earnings. So again, there's not really a huge bearish intonation, even Intel, right? Coming back down, retesting that 50, holding it pretty good. Costco after earnings, having a little bit of a bump fest, but holding that 50 day moving average. So there's nothing really bearish intonation in the market. You can even see like Nike, right? Just a chop fest there, a grand scheme of things. But I do wanna talk about commodities for just a second and how this can be negative price action in the future. With oil and the tensions in the Middle East, oil came down to this level and has not broken. So this pattern is still valid. What is this pattern? It's the biggest freaking wedge I've ever seen in my entire life because it stems back from 2022 all the way to now. So the ending is July, 2025. So it has to break some point there. And right now with the tensions in the Middle East and speaking of freaking tensions in the Middle East, what do you think this is, uh, means? Iran's uh, news agency uh, citing official, all flights canceled in Iran's airports tonight from 9 p.m. to Monday, 6 a.m. Throw down in the comment section what you think that is brewing up to be. And then also throw what your price prediction for oil is gonna be, especially with the tensions in the Middle East, kind of reinvigorated it, but it didn't do it too much. You would think that oil would be going north of $100 a barrel, especially with tensions and war possibility in the Middle East. And that brings us to the question of, does this mean that the markets are basically pricing in a scenario that's not able to occur? So again, the fear and greed index is sitting right at the border of fear and extreme greed, which means the, the markets just want to rally, that I can't get past the point that they just look, they're primed to rally. 
And we have to remember, Warren Buffett is a long-term player. Warren Buffett selling all this stuff is a long-term player. So he's not necessarily looking at tomorrow. He's not looking at a month from now. He's basically saying, hey, I'm going to sit and wait for a good deal. I'm going to wait for this yield curve to basically rip everyone's face off. That doesn't mean we can't make money going up and we can't make money going down. So my top option strategies would probably be maybe selling some volatility on oil, depending if you're spicy for that trade. S&P, I would be looking for that rotation above 570, selling puts above 570, heading into CPI because that IV is going to get built up and then collapse afterwards, especially if you get the right move in your direction. Definitely going to be looking to play futures green. So make sure you guys stop by for that. And subsequently, the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ is going to be the tool that you're going to need. 487.32 is going to be the bullish rotationary point. And that's going to give you the indication of where you have to go. Simply look at the NASDAQ. It'll tell you where you need to go and see the correlation between all the markets. Keep an eye on Bitcoin to make sure that bullish mentality hasn't gone away. And then just check yourself before you wreck yourself with the fear and greed index. And now Fatal is going to give you guys the biggest winners and losers. And then I'll be back to wrap us up. So it turns out that now that the Fed has officially cut interest rates, it's been a decent amount of time. And on top of that, we just got the job reports when it comes to the month of September. Things aren't really moving a lot. In fact, we can see it right here that on the five day, the S&P 500 only gained 0.3 of a percent. That's it. After a massive beat when it came to those job numbers, which I'm pretty sure we will cover them. Things aren't really moving, which makes you question as to why this is the case. You would expect markets to just be rallying because of the soft landing, because the Fed cut rates, and now they're even projecting more rate cuts into the next FOMC, which is November 7th. When taking a look at this upcoming earnings, we're essentially done. Actually, the funny part about this, and I didn't even realize it, we got bank earnings on Friday. <laughs> I just realized that we are officially in Q4, meaning we're going to get Q3 numbers. And the banks are finally reporting this Friday, this literally upcoming Friday. Now, uh, unfortunately, we will not be able to stream, mainly because I have uh, other priorities specifically with my boy. So just understand that, that we will not be having a normal stream that we would have for Friday. Most likely, we will try to do it on Saturday or Sunday. But nonetheless, though, when it comes to Monday, we got companies like Duckhorn, which, eh, whatever. Tuesday, we got Pepsi Cola, which is really the only one. On Wednesday, we got Helen Troy, AZZ, Applied Blockchain. I don't really know any of these companies aside from, like, I don't know, Helen of Troy, I guess you could say. Thursday, we got Tilray and Delta Domino's Pizza, which is one that is uh, in, in a lot of people's radar. And Friday, we got the beginning of earnings season again. Friday, we got JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, BlackRock. Interesting, no city, though. That's very, very interesting. Fastnote, BNY, and uh, BSVN Bank. This is actually, I have not seen most of these. Normally, there's City, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America, but usually Bank of America is the album, but in this case, so is City. Very, very interesting week. And when it comes to the overall heat map, you guys could see that the green is mainly situated in a few pockets here and there, but mainly that energy sector. We'll get to that when we get to that. Starting, of course, with the technology sector, the worst performer here was none other than the company uh, First Solar, losing 9.63%. And the best performer seems to be the company Palantir, gaining 8.61%. Looking now into the communications services, worst performer here was the company Warner Bros. Discovery, losing 7.16%. And the best performer, it is the company Meta, gaining 5.04%. Looking now into the consumer cyclicals, we can see here that the worst performer, wow, seems to be, whoo, seems to be the company Nike. I just put out a video, guys, for this company not too long ago, so make sure to check it out if you would like to know uh, if this company does seem like a buy right now and what their fundamentals actually look like. Here's the video and how it looks like, so make sure to check it out when you guys get a chance. But that was the worst performer, and the best performer seems to be none other than the company uh, Wine Resort. Wine Resort? gaining 8.02 percent into another consumer defensives all of these are essentially in the red all except for a few worst performer it is conegra brand cag losing 9.12 percent and the best performer seems to be the company lamb western holdings which is actually wow it's the only one of three that gained basically lamb western holdings gaining 3.07 percent 
The only ones that gained in this sector were uh, Bungie Global gaining 0.45 and Walmart, which gained 1.45%. And taking a look at the financials, this is all in the green. Wow. Okay, I was not expecting that. Uh, we'll see what happens on Friday. But over here, we got the worst performer being the company. It seems to be the company. Yeah, Franklin Resources losing 4.28%. And the best performer it is none other than Market Access Holdings gaining, if I can get it to, to pop up again, gaining 7.38%. Uh, Into now the healthcare. There's a lot of deep red here, though. Oh, my God goodness you guys are seeing this a lot of deep red but a few massively deep in the green companies worst performer it is none other than i think it's that one humana losing 24.89 percent and the best performer it is the company bmy bristol myers squib getting almost six percent and 5.99 percent on the week looking now into the industrials we got the worst performer here none other than the company expeditors internationals of washington inc losing 6.58 percent and the best performer it is none other than the company it seems to be this one guys jacob solutions gaining 7.84 percent into now the real estate sector all, well, all of these are essentially in the red note to note to anybody out there realty income is above 60 dollars. in fact it's above 62 dollars at 62 dollars and a penny but it did lose this week at 1.15 percent overall though the worst performer is none other than the company uh alexandria real estate equities losing 5.06 percent but also companies like cci lost 4.4 as well as extra space storage losing 4.37 overall though the best performer it is the company irm iron mountain gaining 1.33 percent as well as the company simon properties group getting 1.11 into the utilities a lot of red here but man these these companies right here with like ge the like the spin-offs not really the spin-offs but like the separation of like ge and like constellation brand these gained massively you guys are looking at this right overall though the worst performer it is the company aes corp losing 5.78 percent and the best performer vistra gaining 17 point i really do need to take a look at this company because this company has been making just I mean, you guys take a look at that graph, right? That's insane. That's an absolutely massive jump. So I really would like to take a look at this company because I have no idea what it is. So probably see a video on that in the next upcoming days. And now looking into the energy sector, the Emerald is back. Oh, dear Lord. There's no losses here. There's literally no losses here. If you were anywhere in this sector, you gained this week. This is absolutely insane. So obviously there is no worst performer this is the one that gained the least and that was the company eqt gaining i'm sorry i can't really quite get that gaining 1.12 percent 1.12 percent basically and the best performer seems to be none other than the company diamond back energy gaining 14.05 percent but guys really anywhere in the sector you made out like a bandit this week it was absolutely crazy and lastly basic materials there's a lot of red here only a few green ones worst performer it is none other than the company apd air products losing 4.95 percent and the best performer albemarle gaining 6.29 percent so all in all when it comes to this week uh guys we have one more month left until elections time oh boy uh it's gonna get a lot more volatile we got we already had the, the jobs numbers we're gonna get cpi rather soon i believe if not this week then the, then the next week but we're gonna get that and then we're also gonna get another pce and this is the election so this is going to be interesting shall we it's gonna be very very interesting we shall see what happens so sorry that we couldn't live stream too much this week we'll see what happens next week but Everything should be fine. And thank you so much for watching. With that said, take it away, Mike. So we're going to wrap up by myself today. Fatal had some other obligations he had to get to. But again, remember, fear and greed index in a position that could be very detrimental to the bears. And we also didn't really talk about what happened uh, this previous week, which was job numbers, right? So net speculative positions coming in at a positive. So this is setting up to be an interesting position where the bulls are the only ones that are really exposed versus the bears. And 
I was a little thinking that the Bears were more exposed than the Bulls, so I had to correct myself there. So payrolls, how many of you throw in the comment section actually believe this number? Because personally, I don't think, I think this is another one of those scenarios where they're cooking the numbers and then revise them significantly down the road. Remember, they revised a million, close to a million jobs before. So what is stopping them from doing it now? As we see the previous number, it's like, oh, no, 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 it wasn't that bad. We're gonna revise it from 140 to 159. We're creating jobs. There's plenty of jobs in the economy. Nothing is going horribly wrong. On top of average hourly earnings, employers are having to give more money to employees to incentivize them to come to work. And as we see, that is an inflationary thing in the Fed's mind. So how's that gonna play into the grand scheme of things? The one number I do believe is that the, this manufacturing payroll revised lower and coming in below expectations is probably the only true number out here with payroll numbers. Government payrolls revised upward from 24 to 45. Again, the government loves cooking the books, employment at 4.1. You just gotta love how much BS uh, they're throwing at you and also with the amount of BS with the latest hurricane news, right? U.S. to give 156 million in humanitarian aid in response to Lebanon crisis. You thought I was gonna say the hurricane, but apparently we have enough money to throw at other countries, but we don't have enough money to fix our own country on the inside. And if you guys would not believe the ratioing that is occurring on social media right now, and also if we look at some of the more battleground states, right? As we can see here, the lead is narrowing in states that I said were completely out of play. I said Wisconsin and Michigan were completely out of play. And the lead is slowly trickling down and down and down in those states. The lead in North Carolina and Georgia going up for Trump. So this is very, very interesting playing into the dynamics of the election. Remember, we only have one month left for the election. Pennsylvania still remains a tie. So this is very, very interesting of how the narrative is playing out. And as we see these things occurring, they're cooking the books on all these other numbers, which is basically begging the question of how long are they gonna cook the books before they actually tell you the truth out there? And we'll be covering the election live, so make sure you guys stay tuned for that. But with everything that's going on, right? Like with the economy, fantastic jobs. The question is how long until this number gets thrown out the window, right? How long until the, the expectations become 100% for no rate cut, or sorry, for a rate cut in uh, November? If it's gonna be the 50 or the 25 nature, throw in the comment section below. And also pray for those that are being gonna be affected by this new storm, right? Milton, as it's being called, is gonna hit Tampa as a category three hurricane, and that is gonna cause more and more. But we all know how the administration is gonna handle this. They're basically gonna say, look, you're a red state. We don't care about you. So make sure if you got relatives down there, you let them know, batten down the hatches, maybe tell them to come up to see you versus staying down there. And as always, keep them in your prayers. So with that, guys, we're actually gonna conclude for today. Thank you all so much for watching. I will have the, our latest video queued up over here for you. And if you guys wouldn't mind, hit the subscribe button up above. Great appreciate it. And again, thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.